Across the former United States, wastelanders struggle on a daily basis. From having to scavenge for resources, deal with hostile factions, and live in the ruins of the greatest heyday of humanity, things can be pretty bleak. For people in pre-war times, there was a particular cure when the monotony of day-to-day -day life became too much to handle, and that was to go on holiday. So why don't people of the wasteland travel to other countries? In one answer to the question, we can look to the past. Although many US citizens travelled across the world, not all could. While the technological enhancements and opportunities in the pre-war era were immense, international travel was by and large an option available only to the middle to upper classes, and as inflation rose around the world, this became even more difficult. For the average wastelander, their day-to-day -day struggles mean that they live lives much poorer than even their most destitute pre-war ancestor. A farmer who can build a settlement and support a crop of tato plants is basically a Wall Street fat cat in post-war times. And even they would barely have the resources to be able to take some time off, maintain their holdings and return with either their lives or property unharmed. So of course, the average person in the wasteland wouldn't have the means or even the will to journey outside of the borders of what was once the United States. Sightseeing can be a depressing endeavour when everything looks the same, blown up. But what about other groups or people with the will or the means to do so? Well, some regular people did, or they had to. In post-war times, some wastelanders sought to travel from their own countries to the United States, most often out of desperation. This was largely possible from residents of America's closest neighbours that shared a land border with the nation. Approximately 18 years after the Great War, Randall Clark observed 28 newcomers that arrived into his home of Zion National Park. However, he was unable to eavesdrop on their conversation, given the fact that he did not speak their native tongue, Spanish. Clark speculated that they journeyed from Mexico, or even possibly further down in South America, and carefully observed the group as they settled into the region. Things evidently were extremely bad in their home country, as the group were heard to refer to Zion as Pariso, or Paradise. They also seemed to hold on to their Christian beliefs, having praised Dios, or God, when Randall secretly intervened to save one of their group members. The fate of the Mexican visitors was unfortunately not a happy one, but they were not the last visitors to arrive in the post-war United States from Mexico. Companion Raul Tejada was born in pre-war Mexico approximately 30 years before the Great War. Raul was able to provide a first-hand account on life outside of the US pre- and post-war, which is unfortunately as grim as life had been in America. Having lived on his family's ranch on the outskirts of Mexico, the Tejada family were initially spared the worst of the devastation that destroyed much of the world. Mexico City was hit much the same as other pre-war capitals, although noticeably not as bad as Washington DC had been. After having tried to assist the starving refugees pouring out of the ruined city, his family began to turn people away, upon which they were burned alive by an angry mob. Raul and his sister Rafaela were the only survivors. With nowhere else to go, the two fled to Mexico City, which was already filled to the brim with raider tribes. And after having lost his sister to said tribes, Raul chose to leave all he had in Mexico behind, including his name. Assuming a new name, he made his way across the no longer existent border to the US and settled into Tucson, Arizona, now known as the more literal Tucson. Travelers from the north, such as Canada, have also journeyed to the post-war United States in the years after the bombs fell. Technically, since Canada was annexed by the US, I suppose it wasn't even into country travel really, but two Canadians can be found in the post-war United States. One, named Dave Handy, stated that he travelled all the way to San Francisco from Canada, after having become infatuated with a particularly notorious post-war movie star. Another, Marge Labarge, states that she was born in the Yukon, on the shores of Lake LaBerge. Her exact reasons for migrating down north are unknown, but it appears that the opportunities for work were far greater in California than back home. Of course, these examples stem from post-war eras, but in the immediate decades after the Great War itself. In the confusion and chaos over this time, people would no doubt seek to uproot themselves and travel for miles to seek a better life. But as the dust settled and the post-war communities formed, people began to stay put, except in some exceptional circumstances. In the town of Megaton, a sly and ruthless proprietor can be found by the name of Colin Moriarty. Moriarty stands out immensely from the other residents of the town, 
and even in the capital wasteland. He speaks with a thick Irish accent and makes references akin to one raised in the Emerald Isles. That's right. Your father, his brotherhood a steel friend, and you, the suckling babe with nary a tit to suckle. Sorry about your mom, truly. Although Moriarty himself claims that his grandfather helped found the town of Megaton, this is evidently a lie. One, since his grandfather would need to have been alive at least 190 years in the past, and two, because Moriarty himself was not born within the post-war United States. Herbert Dashwood makes note in his records that Moriarty arrived with his father from lands overseas, stating, I hear Moriarty even has his own place now. Guess that shouldn't surprise me. That guy has been playing the angle since the day he ended up in this country as a kid. Furthermore, one of the lead designers of Fallout 3, Emil Pagliarello, commented that, The east coast of the US has traditionally been really a hub of immigration. We have characters like in Megaton and Fallout 3, there's Moriarty, who, he's Irish, and it's like, where does he come from? He has an Irish accent and an Irish brogue, he's from Ireland, and so, what is Ireland like? Another Wasteland resident who had arrived from across the sea is that of Alistair Tenpenny. Fallout 3's own entry logs list him as a British refugee, who had come to the capital Wasteland to seek his fortune. Having been born in the former United Kingdom in 2197, Tenpenny arrived on the shores of Washington DC in his relative youth, and made his mark as an entrepreneur and cutthroat businessman. Emil Pagliarello again outlines Tenpenny's appearances as a thought-provoking exercise, stating that, Alistair Tenpenny came to the capital wasteland from Great Britain to seek his fortune, so that alone tells you that the UK was also hit in the war. And if he came to the US to succeed, then that says a lot about how screwed up Europe must be. So we allude just a little bit to the state of the rest of the world. We like to leave a lot to the players' imaginations, and somebody like Tenpenny serves as a catalyst for those thoughts. However, the reason Tenpenny came from overseas can be left open to interpretation. Throughout history, residents of well-to-do areas often sought glory and adventure in lands outside of their own domains, with their expeditions only able to be funded due to their considerable wealth and power back at home. Tenpenny and others like him may not have necessarily arrived in the US because post-war UK and Europe are in such a devastating state, but potentially because they're firing far better than the US. A similar concept is visible in the NCR scavengers found in New Vegas and other lands beyond the NCR, who state that, due to the security and safety of the Republic, they find themselves journeying out to more hostile lands in order to seek glory and riches. Tenpenny is an elusive character, however, and more so as Emil recently seemed to contradict his own statements, claiming that people don't know this, but Alistair Tenpenny from Fallout 3, who has a British accent, well, that's fake, actually. He's pretending to be this dude. Again, still open to interpretation if Tenpenny is a US-born citizen faking the British accent, or if he is UK-born but faking the posh accent in order to present himself as a more cultivated individual than he actually was. Those are the characters that we have concrete information on, but there are a few other ones whose origins tend to indicate that they, or their recent ancestors, had arrived in the United States. We've got Kate, a possible companion who is evidently Irish, you think I inject myself with all that shite and drink myself drunk because I'm a tough Irish girl? The demon Yefim Bobrov, a Diamond City proprietor who was stated by the developers to be of Ukrainian descent. You might try to kill me over debts. All is well, friend. Relax. There's even a fisherman in Far Harbour who claims that his family hails from Yorkshire. Family legend has it we hail from Yorkshire. Not entirely sure where that is. Capital Wasteland, maybe. And lastly, there's a great Khan named Melissa that seems to hail from New Zealand, but the game's developers did clarify that it was just due to a voice acting error. If you ever come out to Red Rock Canyon, I'll put in a good word for you. Despite the uncertainty of when these characters' families arrived from overseas, they evidently must have done so. Travel by a boat is still possible across the wasteland, as individuals ply the trade routes along the east and west coasts. Some, such as Tobar's vessels, are fairly shoddy contraptions, no longer able to travel vast distances. However, the Nakanos own an incredibly modern and well-maintained boat that is able to pilot itself all the way from Boston to Maine. There evidently is some form of intercontinental trade and travel across the Atlantic Ocean between the residents of these former nations. We've seen many of their arrivals make their mark in the post-war United States after leaving their former country behind. We just haven't seen or heard of many individuals leaving the US itself, except for one in particular. This individual we can meet is Captain Zhao, 
the captain of the Yangtze 31 submarine, formerly of the People's Republic of China's Navy. Zhao himself is one of the reasons that Boston is the irradiated hellscape that it is today, having launched his nukes at the city the day of the Great War. And yet, having struck a mine in the harbour, he was forced to remain put in the land of the enemy. With 200 years passing, Zhao gave up on his hatred against the capitalists and sought only to return to his homeland of China. And with the help of the sole survivor, he does. I sail for Zhongguo, return to China, where I belong, my jia, my home. Captain Zhao opens up an interesting insight into what inter-country travel would look like. Depending on the route he chooses to take, Zhao would maybe pass through the Suez Canal or make a round trip underneath South America to reach his destination. And while it would be interesting to see what these post-war countries are looking like, it's understandable why Bethesda has chosen not to. The game's narratives often centre around the struggles of local communities and factions, making international travel much less relevant to the core gameplay experience. The topic of inter-country travel was going to be explored by the cancelled game Fallout Extreme, However, it's honestly a good thing that they never did, or at least not in the way that they planned to. If you've never heard of it before, a short synopsis of this cancelled game reads, The player controls a squad of revolutionaries known as the Cause. Throughout the game, they'd gain momentum, starting in Oregon, then north through Washington, Canada, and eventually reaching Alaska. However, after defeating them, the player would learn why the Brotherhood set out to Canada and Alaska in the first place. The cause must now venture across the Bering Strait through Russia, Mongolia, and finally into China in order to disarm the Doomsday Missile that would obliterate what's left of the United States of America. The endgame would then take place within the Forbidden City, where the Chinese Emperor resides. So as interested as I am in the post-war countries, I hope they're never fully explored if they follow that plotline, as it sounds awful. It's not to say that we might never experience other countries in the Fallout series or have them affect the plotline itself, it's just that it would need to be done right. The NCR has evidently expended its borders out of the pre-war United States territory, given that they've laid claim to Baja. The region itself is shrouded in a degree of mystery which the developers of New Vegas stated was intentional, given that the NCR rangers allocated there chase ghosts, rather than assigned to the front lines of the Mojave campaign. If the NCR appear in any further entries, we'll likely have more information on their Mexican territories. So ultimately, people do travel into country in the Fallout universe. It's obviously easy to do so via the land borders that exist between Canada and Mexico, but individuals do still journey across the sea in search of riches, glory, and adventure. However, these individuals are relatively few and far between. People have been travelling across vast oceans for centuries with much more primitive craft than what is available to wastelanders today. Sure, the navies of the world would be in varying states of disrepair, but given the boats such as Nakano's or Tobar's are still in existence, they are capable of travelling vast distances. It's not out of the realm of possibility for other craft to exist. However, the resources and technology required for long distance travel, particularly across vast oceans or continents, are scarce in the post-apocalyptic setting. Not only this, but the will itself is scarce. For a wastelander of any nation to choose to cross a hazardous sea or a large expense of territory, their situation at home would have to be so bad to make it necessary to make that journey. Or, they'd have to be the type of thrill seeker that doesn't find death claws, super mutants and ghouls enough of a challenge, and wishes to see what opportunities might lie on faraway shores. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you've enjoyed, and I'll see you around like a rissole.